Nick, welcome to Locked In, man. Uh, pleasure having you. Uh, you're from, you're in New York City now? Yeah, I'm from Brooklyn, raised Brooklyn, still live in Brooklyn. And you guys have a jewelry store in New York City too? Yes, Brooklyn, Williamsburg. Awesome. And it just opened up? Uh, we've been there for like two years now, so we're still pretty new, yeah. Oh, awesome, man. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And we'll have the link to that in the description of this episode. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, Magic Mind at all? I think I probably heard the advertisement on your channel. That's about it. Yeah, so it's like a mental uh, performance energy boost, and I've been doing it um, like before we dive into these episodes because I've been doing longer episodes and so many a week now. I've been putting out like five episodes a week. Um, so taking one of these before every episode uh, helps a lot with like mental clarity and, and staying focused and kind of like dialed in. You want to try one of these? I'm sure are, are you in so, energy? I'm yeah, sure. here, take a sip well, of that. It's an energy drink? Yeah, it's matcha flavored. Um, it's not like one of those ones that like crashes you after you take it. It's like a truth serum? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Like hey, you, you opened it fresh right in front yeah. of me. So, How much should I drink? The whole thing? Drink the whole thing, yeah. Um, it's a good flavor. I don't know if you're into matcha at all. Let me know what you think yeah, about that. It tastes that. pretty good. It tastes better than it looks. <laughs> yeah, you got to <laughs> shake it up. It's good served cold. Um, I, I've been doing them daily now, and it, and it really helps. You don't feel like burnt out after. Yeah. Um, and it just helps with. I like, mean, it's the probably good as being that we do with numbers, weights all day. It yeah. It kind of gets draining. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and and it helps keep you focused, and it's really good. We'll we'll have the promo code for them in the description of this episode. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, I was never really into matcha um, growing up and stuff, and then you know we got Magic Mind, and the matcha is pretty good. So, did you grow up in New York? Yeah, I grew up in Brooklyn, born and raised. Brooklyn, okay. What was that like growing up there? Uh, growing up was a little rough for my brother and I. Um, my father died when we were seven, and then shortly after, we dealt with like homelessness and things like that. What did uh, your parents do for work before he passed? Well, my well, father was old when he had us, so uh, he was pretty much already sick almost our whole life, diagnosed with the cancer and fighting that already. What about your mom? What did she do? Uh, she worked for like a real estate agency. Do you have any uh, like fond memories with your dad or are you too young? No, I remember we used to like go with him to the coffee shop every morning and we used to cry if we didn't wake up early enough to go with him. Like that's about it. No, it was just you and your brother growing up. Yeah, since he was older, all of our siblings are way older than us. So we're not really close to them like that. Oh, you do have other siblings yeah, too. Yeah, we have a lot of siblings from his side and we have like... Two, two more from my mom's side. Ah, uh, so they, they had met, and then uh, you have step-siblings. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And um, the th interesting fact also about your brother is he is your identical twin. Yeah. Were you guys born uh, at the exact same time or minutes I'm apart? seven minutes older. But wow. people, people tend to think he's older for some reason. Yeah, when you guys walked in, you were wearing the same outfits right now. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's identical. Yeah. And he's in the jewelry business with you? Yeah, he's in the jewelry business, and he's also in, uh, still on contract with the military. And and that's also interesting. Part of your story is that one of you ended up in prison and one of you ended up in the military. Yeah. Um, so after your father passed, what was life kind of like for you guys? Why was that such a pivotal moment for you? Well, honestly, that was our first experience with death. You know, we had to see him with the casket. And, we, uh, you know, when you're a kid, you don't think about how bad it is. But when we're older, you look back at stuff and we see it through a different lens. But it was tough because shortly after, one day we was playing basketball in the park and my mom came with a shopping cart, and she basically told us that the marshals put a padlock on the door and we got evicted. So it was, you know, at the time we didn't feel sad. We were more upset with her that she said that in front of our friends and embarrassed us. So, yeah, that's when everything took a turn right there. Did you understand what eviction was and what had happened? No, like I said, we were just mad that our friends heard it. Mm. That's it. And then from there we started staying with family. Did you guys know you were financially struggling at all at the time? No idea. So it just caught us completely off guard. Were your uh, friends well off or had money or were they in the sim similar situation? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I don't think we thought of it like that. I think, yeah, I think most of us were struggling financially because we were all doing like packing bags in the supermarket, shoveling snow, like things like that to make money at a young age. And it was a bunch of us doing it. So I'm pretty sure we all came from, you know, the lower class. How would uh, your friends, if, if they were here right now, describe you and your brother? I think it depends on what point in my life they know me from. If you're talking childhood friends, they probably know us as, like, you know, a little, like, to fight and things like that. Mischievous, I would say. So y you guys get evicted from your house. Where do you guys go? At first, we stood in a relative in uh, Bed-Stuy, Roosevelt Projects, for a little while. 
And then we moved back to my original neighborhood, downtown Brooklyn, Wyckoff Projects with another relative, which it was still the projects, but we were happy just to be in the neighborhood we were familiar with again. Was your mom uh, actively working or was she struggling herself? Uh, she's struggling, yeah. She, she's not, she's a little off mentally. So, you know, her raising us probably wasn't the easiest. She was struggling to take care of herself. Yeah. So we ended up being raised, like I said, by a relative. And she raised us till we was about 15. And when you say relative, is this like an aunt or a... <laughs> well, like I said, my dad was older. So technically, she's my niece, but we call her my aunt because she's older than me. Oh. So we just don't really get into that too much. Everybody knows how's my aunt. Okay. Or like second mom, I guess you could say. Yeah, a lot of people like refer to cousins or yeah. different uh, family members as like a, a different type of family member. Yeah, if I say niece, it would just look weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the age thing is is definitely um, could cause that. Yeah. So she was raising you till fifteen. Were you guys actively going to high school? That's the thing. We was we was uh, getting a lot of trouble, doing bad stuff. So eventually, we got too much to manage, and we you know we had to find another arrangement. And then that's when we went back with my mom. But at that point, she was in the shelter, so we had to stay by in the shelter. Oh, you guys actually stayed with her in the shelter? Yeah, but it was horrible in the sense of, like, she would work. The curfew was 9 p.m., but she would work till about midnight doing security. So we would have to be there for curfew, but the building wouldn't allow us in without her because we were minors. So we were literally standing outside from midnight to, like, 1 in the morning every day. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's just... It was a bad neighborhood, and so it wasn't really a good situation for teenagers. Now, describe what the shelter was like. Are you guys sharing a bed, or do you get your own bed when you, you bring kids? Because you guys were a little bit older. No, it's kind of like an apartment. It was a we had a bunk bed. It's like a studio apartment. That's the best way to describe it. With security, it's it's not like that's it was being that we were family. It's a family shelter. It's a little better than the men's shelter. The men's shelter is kind of like jail. I got to experience that for like a week when I was a little older, but. Back then, it wasn't too bad. It was just the neighborhood was bad. And it was, like I said, when you were a teenager, it was a little uh, embarrassing. So we didn't like it. And eventually, we even got kicked out of there, to be honest. <laughs> Why did you guys get kicked out? And one day, me and my brother started fighting each other. And then the security guy intervened, and then we ended up fighting him. Did they give you guys food in, in the shelter? No, but, you know, my mom would get food stamps and stuff like that to buy the food with. They don't feed you on Thanksgiving. They'll give you free turkeys and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, not really. Was it hard seeing when you guys did go to school, seeing other kids grow up a lot differently than you? Like I said, when we was young, we didn't really notice it. You know, it was everybody we knew. Well, once we was like 14, 13, we pretty much was outside kids anyway, and we was trying to make our own money. So we didn't really, it was just a living situation that was messed up. But we, pre we pretty much felt like we were older than we were at the time. So what happens after you guys get kicked out of the shelter? My mom called me crying, and she was mad at us, but we told her basically we didn't care because we didn't want to be there anyway. And then that's when we really just, like I said, we was ready in the streets, so it was nothing for us to find a, a friend's place to crash at and things like that. So we was actually happy at not being there. Do you think getting kicked out of the shelter caused you to, you know, get into more uh, illegal activities or, or crime, so to say? I think the whole circumstance had us aggressive because, like I said, we was outside younger than we should be. So it, we definitely had pent-up anger, and we felt the need to prove ourselves. So, yeah, definitely it was spiraled from that, yeah, because we had more freedom. We was able to move around, and we was doing all the wrong things. So when's, like, the first time you guys get into trouble as a teenager? I think when we was, like, 13, 14, regular stuff, getting caught with knives, we got kicked out of school. And I think the first time I got really arrested and went through the system was for, uh, I had a warrant for a knife, and then they locked me up for fireworks. And they was trying to charge me with, like, some crazy thing about, like, it's enough M80s to equal a stick of dynamite. So they was trying to scam me with that. And, yeah, that was the first time I went through the system. Why knives? Why fireworks? Well, now it's because you carry it daily and you know, you don't want to walk around everywhere with a gun, but you don't want to not have nothing either, you know? And fireworks, that just happened randomly. It was the 4th of July, and they just caught me with the bag. And the cops, and you had a warrant out for your arrest for the knives. Yeah, so, yeah. Like I said, the first time I went through the system, they told me I could either take five days and come back to court, or I could take 10 days and get it over it. So I just took the 10 days. 10 days in a county jail? 
We had Rikers Island. That was my first time at Rikers. Oh, you went to Rikers at, and how old were you at that? I was just turned 16. Wow. What was that like at 16 years old? Well, honestly, it kind of set me up for failure later when I went back to Rikers because uh, when I got there, you know, I, I was like the only adolescent. So they was telling me, yo, shorty, better be careful. You know, they'd let me know what's going to happen. And then when I went up there, I remember I went in the bathroom and some kid was standing close behind me. So when I turned around, I'm like, yo, you all right? And then he was trying me, but he was bluffing me because I realized after we was about to fight, a kid I knew came out the back and was like, nah, I told you my boy's not no punk. And they, they left me alone. So I did that 10 days, no problem. But the dilemma was that I thought if you just show that you're tough, they'll leave you alone. And I learned later, nah, you can't, you can't bluff. You got to prove it. So you were trying to act uh, tough, but not well, actually I was really able to fight, yeah, but I was yeah. obviously scared. It's your first time in jail, yeah. So when you're 16 at Rikers, is there a separate area where they keep the teenagers? Yeah, so they keep the 16 and 19 separated in the housing units from the grown men, but you in overall the building, you see them in the hallways and everything like that, yeah. Uh, what about eating? Is that separate or you guys It depends eating? what house. Not every house go to the mess hall. A lot of them, they bring the food to the cell block. And in your case, did you guys go to the mess hall? Well, that one, I was already sent to 10 days. So, uh, yeah, we was going to mess hall, I think, yeah. So, it's still, you're still exposed to, you know, older, dangerous figures at that age. Yeah, but I don't know about dangerous because they looked at the young kids like the dangerous ones. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> did you learn anything more about, like, crime? Like, do you think going to jail at that young age made you a, a, more of a criminal? Yeah, definitely, because you get praised when you come home as if you graduated college or something. Just by members of the street? And yeah. And did family members praise you or just the street? No, nah, just the street. So what's that like? You're, you're getting now after 10 days, which is really nothing. It's like a slap on the wrist. And what are, what are people saying to you? Well, it was a pretty common. Everybody, I, I thought everybody went to jail at one point or another. So it was just like, all right, it was my turn to go pretty much. Were, were you and your brother ever, like, operating with any street gangs or anything like that? Or did you say stay on your own, just in your own little groups? Uh, in the streets, we were, so, like, affiliated with a lot of gang members, but we didn't actually join a gang. I did eventually join a gang later on, though. Why do you think you guys didn't want to join at a young age? Because we were friends with different gangs, and we didn't want it to be a conflict of interest. Because we moved around to a lot of neighborhoods, we so we had crip friends, blood friends. We didn't want to... Be, join one and then not be cool with the other type of situation. So had you joined, like, the Crips, you wouldn't be able to be friends with the Bloods? Probably could have, but, you know, it just would have felt fake to them being that we hung out with them a lot too, you know? Did you think that lifestyle was, like, cool or entertaining at that age? Uh, not really. I, my thing was I just looked up to the drug dealers. I just wanted to be like them. They had the power. They had the swag. They had the money. Was that what it was for for you? Like, you wanted to become that? Not that I wanted to become. I wanted to become the the aura that they had. I wasn't. I didn't care how I would have got. I would have got it with a job, if I had the opportunity as well at the time. But that's all we knew. Why do you think you didn't go the route of the job? You, you just mentioned about not having the opportunity. Uh, did, was it someone not teaching you? Because I never seen nobody that owned a business or anything that looked cool enough that I wanted to be like at the time. That's why now that I'm on a business owner, I hope to inspire some of the youth and show an outline that you could be cool, work a job, and work your way up. Why do you think that wasn't taught in your area and and at your age at the time that it was you know cool to be successful running your own business? Well, people wanted to be cool and successful. They just wanted to do it legally. I guess they didn't want to, you know. If, I'm sure you know how business is. It doesn't happen overnight like people would think. It takes a lot of struggle and and doing the wrong thing. You get instant results. You go outside, you make money today. Mm -hmm. You got a business, you make money, you reinvest it, you reinvest it for years before you see a dollar. It's a grind, and you have to, you know, while people are out partying and drinking, you have to be at, you know, home or, or at your business grinding, yeah. you know, putting in the hours. It's nonstop. I mean, we're here at a Sunday working. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's an, it's, it never ends, you know. There's not yeah. like a fully a day off. But, you know, I'm sure you know this. Probably with your podcasting career, there's probably people you know that got inspired to get into it after they seen your success. So that's why I say if you have an outline— of somebody you admire doing something successful, you might try it. But if you don't have that to look to look up to, then how would you know? It's lucrative. Yeah. I, All possibility. There's so many people that reach out about, you know, wanting to get yeah. into podcasts. You guys are starting one too, you were yeah. mentioning. Yeah, a jewelry-related podcast, but, you know, jewelry is kind of boring, so we're trying to highlight the individuals that wear the jewelry. 
and their story, how they're able to afford those things, what it means to them, and things of that nature. And, and there's a power in storytelling, you know, as we see with this podcast yeah. and a lot of other podcasts. Well, I do that. When I'm in the club with some, I see dudes with a lot of money and jewelry. I always wonder, what, what do they do for a living? So it's nice to get those people in and really ask them. And maybe, maybe they could spy others, you know? Maybe you become one of those, like, TikTokers that go up to the people with the nice jewelry and say, hey, what do you do for work like they do with <laughs> the apartments and the cars? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so w what happens after you get out of Rikers? Uh, are you kind of staying out of trouble or are you just getting into more trouble? I'm just getting into more trouble. Well, you know, we was trying to, you know, hustle, sell drugs, and the older dudes weren't too fond of that, so we was having a hard time with that, but we wasn't letting nobody tell us nothing pretty much. And do you ever complete high school, get a degree or a, high, a diploma? I got my degree, my diploma in jail. And I actually got it faster than I would have in high school. <laughs> cool, because it was probably like a three or four week class or something. Yeah, I got the GED at like probably 17. I would have graduated high school at 18. So I came home with a GED. What year, uh, how old were you when you actually got a full prison sentence? I was 16. And how much time did you get? Two years. And what was that for? It was an assault, um, assault with a weapon. Uh, me and my brother got into physical altercation with a guy from another neighborhood. Uh, he pulled out a knife, and I just got to mine quicker. And did you kill him? Did you hurt him? What nah, happened? Actually, we got away from the scene after it happened, and he was in a coma. But when we had detectives calling our phone, and once he recovered, I turned myself in, me and my brother. And did your brother actually get charged, or was it just you? Yeah, we were both charged, and... Uh, they let him out after a few days, though, and they kept me, I guess, because the witnesses had more evidence than even talking. It was crazy because we're twins. Like, they didn't find the weapon either, so we could have probably beat it with a good trial attorney, but we didn't want to risk it. And it was like, it's better one of us go instead of both of us. So, yeah. But, and honestly, he, he got stabbed in the hand in the altercation, so I guess because he had a defensive wound that kind of helped him. And, you know, there's no self-defense in New York. So basically, even though I was helping my brother, they said I should have minded my business. So they dropped the charges against him? Uh, he beat him after a while. He pulled uh -huh. the case for like two years. And plus, he signed up for the military in the process, so the military helped him with an attorney and things like that. So the military still accepted him even while he was pending charges for assault? Well, they didn't accept him, but it pending the outcome of the case, he was ready to go, and which he did. Why did he decide he wanted to go to the military? I don't think he was too much thought into it. I think somebody probably approached him. I never asked him that question, I said, but I, assume, I would assume somebody approached him he didn't have much going on in the streets. He probably said, why not? Let's go. Do you wish you went down that path as him? Definitely. It definitely helped us later in life as far as like VA loans for mortgages and stuff like that. Um, the only thing was is that I guess you guys weren't old enough yet at the time to even join, right? Could yeah. you join at 16? Or? No, but, you know, once you get your GD college degree, 17, 18, so, yeah. Yeah, but you had gotten into that, you caught that case before, so there wasn't even a... Yeah, so at the time when I initially caught the case, he was stressed. My bail wasn't even that much. It was like 40000 which with bond is, is probably, a normal person could probably bail out. So he was probably getting a little worse trying to come up with that money. I mean, we didn't have much people in our corner. What did your mom say when you guys both got arrested for this case? Are, were you guys in contact? Yeah, my family dynamic is not like the typical, you know, loving home. So it, was, it wasn't really, I don't think nobody was surprised, to be honest. I think they're uh, all right. Did you have any type of support system battling those charges, getting faced with that? Most of the support system came from my friends who were too young to really visit me too much anyway. So, yeah, yeah I pretty much did the bit alone. Now, because you're, you and your brother are twins, were you guys that was one able to get into trouble and the other one could, like, cover for them, like, just in, in time? Because, you know, uh, being it, literally identical. It helped later <laughs> on with parole as far as, like, curfew and stuff. Maybe he could uh, cover for me if I want to go out type uh, of situation. Uh, yeah, because yeah. uh, is there, like, physical differences that people can't see about Yeah, you? people that know us, they could tell us apart. But if you don't know us and at a glimpse, you ain't going to be able to tell the difference. Yeah, you really can't. Yeah. That's so I interesting. Called, like I said, I caught two impersonation charges under his name at one point, <laughs> and it almost messed up his career. Wow. Yeah. So did he have to distance himself for you while he when he finished his case and, and joined the military? No, but I, at one point I caught a drug case and I had his ID in my pocket, and I tried to explain to the officer that's not me. And he didn't believe me, and he lost his security clearance and his job behind that. Yeah, and it was a whole situation investigation, so I don't, I, wouldn't, I don't do that no more. I'll tell you that. And he got reinstated? Yeah, he had to stay longer in the military away because of the situation because he had to clear it up. Holy cow. By the time I was in jail, he was at work, so it's like, how could I be in two places at once? It's obviously not him. <laughs>
So the military thought that he was the one dealing the drugs. Yeah, it ended up on his rap sheet, and he had to clear it out. Yeah. Wow, that's a great. Yeah. But uh, DNA could have, you know. Well, fingerprints too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because he was finger. You both were fingerprinted. You were yeah. in prison. He was in the yeah. military. Yeah. So when you when you they didn't give you bail, where do you stay at Rikers or at like a precinct? Or? No, I stood in Rikers. Yeah. So they send you to Rikers, and is that a separate part of the jail than the people that are sentenced? Yeah, that's all people fighting their case, that whole building. And this is your 16? 16, So yeah. you're back in, like, the youth kind of housing area? Yeah, I was 16, like 120 pounds and, like, 5'7". Was there anyone that you had remembered from when you were there a couple of years prior? No. I it, didn't know nobody. It was at all first. new people? Yeah. Okay. And that's when I know later on I was going to jail too much because I walked through intake and I see somebody I know. <laughs> but that first time I didn't know nobody. How do, how do the guards uh, treat kids at Rikers? I don't want to bad talk all guards, but Rikers, man, the guards act like inmates, believe it or not. And they, you know, their job, they don't want to do paperwork. So if they, they don't mind letting the gang or somebody control the housing area to make their job easier. It's definitely corrupt. Not all, but some. Would you say it's just the male guards or is it a mixture of male and woman? I, I don't know. I feel bad saying it, but women guards, in my experience, are probably worse than the male guards because they're emotional. And, you know, they favor inmates. They let certain things slide. And if you've got enemies, you, you're pretty much on your own. You can't count on the guard to, to help you. So y your first day back at Rikers at 16, do you know how to navigate it better now that you were there for that, you know, week before? No, like I said, I was super green. So the first incident I got into, I didn't even make it to housing area. I got into it my first time going to court. And somebody tried to take my PIN number, which is to use the phone. Because they could hear when you're in the, like, the intake house. They know if you're like a new jack. So he tried to give me the, the pen and paper to give him the number, and I threw it on the floor. I said, I ain't giving you shit. So he didn't do nothing, but he was talking crap. Oh, wait till you get to the housing area. We're going to see how tough you are and things like that. But he didn't do nothing. So like I said, being that I got through the first time without getting into it, you know, when you experience in prison, you know, if somebody even asks you something like that, you're supposed to pop off. But like I said, I just thought I could get by bluffing my way through and. Like, if you go to court, it's like a 12-hour situation. So it was 12 hours. We weren't talking to each other no more, and I, and I wasn't even worried about them. When we got off the bus back to Rikers, next thing you know, I get sucker punched, and I'm fighting, like, three dudes. And, and what were they, like, his boys or something I like guess, that? yeah, gang, man. I don't even know because I didn't even see the punch coming. He, I was sitting down. He hit me. My head hit the back of the wall. I jumped up, and it's, like, two or three other people. What do you even do in a situation like that? How can you defend yourself? I just got to fight. The CO came. He heard it. And then they came, unlocked the gate. They didn't give us a ticket or nothing. They just sent us back to the house. And That's you, when I knew it was no joke. I'm like, oh, shit, this is for real. Yeah. So yeah. How, did you start to move differently after that? Yeah, I was definitely on point every time I went to court. But, yeah, I would say my, my first bid, my first three weeks was just getting jumped. Now talk about that, you know, experience going to court. That's It's brutal, and I can't even imagine from Rikers, which is an even more brutal uh, place to be at. Yeah, and I caught my case in a different borough than the borough I was from, so I didn't never see nobody I knew. And it was a, probably a long day of travel. They woke you up early in the morning. Yeah, and especially with the adolescents, you got to worry about you got nice sneakers or whatever. You got to be able to hold it down because they definitely looking to rob people. Why do you think the young ones are more dangerous than the adults at Rikers? I think they just uh, want to prove themselves, and they don't know how, so they think just being wild is the best way. And it's a lot of gang stuff, so. Obviously, it's, I know the older era was a lot of stabbing, cutting, but at least you had a chance to, to prove yourself on your own. My generation was more like, you go in the house, if you don't want to give up your stuff and you're not in the gang, you're going to fight half the house and go to another house and do it again. Did you have that same, you know, young kind of violent mentality at Rikers? Not at first. At first, I was just trying to find somewhere I could relax at, but it didn't happen for a while. And why do you think your mentality changed over time? Because a lot of times when you get jumped in there, like the the person probably that initiated, you look at him and you're like, under normal circumstances, he wouldn't be talking to me like that. But because he got a gang behind him, it's a little, you know, it's tough. So eventually you just understand that they only respect violence in there. So you got to turn up a little bit if you want to live. How are you feeling mentally and emotionally being in there with not much support from the outside world? Besides the fighting and stuff, I, it, it didn't really bother me. Like, later on, I, my last bit, I only did, like, 45 days, and that thing killed me because I actually had stuff in the streets 
to lose. Back then, it, it didn't really bother me much, to be honest. It was like, once I adjusted, living in the projects, it was similar. So it was like, I didn't have much going on at home. I was still a kid, pretty much. So it, I didn't really put too much thought into it. How long did it take you to go through the, the criminal justice system, the process, before you actually got sentenced to the two years? I, I got sentenced pretty quick. It was only a couple months. And you took a plea deal right away? Yeah, because two years didn't sound too bad, considering what happened. Yeah. What was the final charge? Just like felony assault? assault? They dropped it to assault in the second. Okay. What was the original charge? I think it was assault in the first. Okay. And that what would that have carried as a sentence? I don't know. I didn't... Uh... It was a lot, though. I was scared. I know when I first went in, I thought I was going to do like 10 years. Okay. And on a two-year sentence, how much do you have to do on that? Like 20 months because it's violent, but I ended up doing the whole two. You lost all your good time? Yeah. What were some, you know, examples of what, what was going on in there that you lost your good time? Uh, well, like I, I didn't realize how corrupt Rikers was till I went upstate, and you see it's more like by the book. So I, when you come from Rikers, you bring that mentality to upstate, and it's, it's not the same type of guards. You're not getting away with stuff. They give you tickets if you break the rules, and I, I had to learn that the hard way. So the first time I went to the box, was for like assault on staff. Why do you assault the staff? I did, and that's the crazy part. They assaulted me, but I just didn't like let it. I just didn't let them just do whatever they wanted. So I was pretty much defending myself for no reason, to be honest. The guy, the CEO. I was working the mess hall. The CEO said something like, go over there. I was probably trying to steal, like, sugar or something. I don't know. But he was like, go over there. I was like, all right. And then when I was walking over there, the other CEO said, like, hey, kid, come here. So when I turned to walk to him, the guy, they, they hit me from behind and said, didn't I tell you go over there? And then I turned around. We start tussling. Next thing you know, it's like, I don't know how many guards. They was on me. <laughs> so the staff was assaulting you. Yeah. And you're I, just a kid. Yeah, you're... but they was, you know, a lot of them was like, some, some guards are tough. But at that moment, it was like older people so they couldn't really do nothing with me you know so we just tussling they were trying to take me down I wasn't letting them and then you know like I said I had that Rikers mentality so when they bring me to the sergeant's office with the handcuffs and everything I was talking shit like yo take these handcuffs off and and, I, and then the sergeant slapped me with the handcuffs on yeah I was like oh shit <laughs> so I was still talking shit but I noticed it was corrupt because the the nurse seen everything and then they put me in a room. She was like, oh, my God, are you okay? I thought she cared. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And then she just started checking the paper. Oh, good, no injuries reported. I'm like, what? You just seem, <laughs> you know, I didn't say that. I'm thinking, like, you just seem like. And then when they took the picture of me, they took it, like, from two rooms away. So, so they don't show no injuries. But I said, I was still talking crap. But when they bring me to the box, I noticed bigger dudes with gloves and stuff on. And I'm looking for a camera. I don't see no cameras. So I'm like, oh, shit, they about to jump me. And then, uh. When they strip searched me, I swear they definitely did jump me, I'll tell you that. When you were actually, before you went into the cell? Oh, I was in the box, yeah. So they they set you up. So the way they do it is they put your hands on the wall, but they put your legs so far away from the wall that you, like, slanted at an awkward angle. And they tell you, like, with your right hand, grab your left sock and don't take your other hand off the wall. So I try to do it. And I grabbed the sock. That One of them hit me in, like, the stomach. And then I took my hand off the wall. And then there's a few of them start hitting me. And honestly, it didn't even hurt like that, but I, I, I didn't want to die. So I was like, ah, 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 until they stopped. I ain't going to lie. I, ain't gonna, I didn't go out with them that time. I just took the L. How many guards were attacking you? It was probably only like two or three. It wasn't much. And this is all because they felt like you attacked yeah, their Yeah, because that's guards. what they said when I walked in. Oh, we got one. He likes to assault staff, even though I really didn't do it. So there's no other guards that are, like, decent human beings that are well, standing up for you? Well, the sergeant that took the hearing, he was pretty decent because he was— I called a lot of witnesses that happened in the mess hall, but I, he's like, I can't let you beat this because I think it's best if you just get out the jail. And he gave me just enough time to get me moved to another jail. Where'd they move you to after that? I went to Green S Block, which is a, a SU-200. And what does that mean? It's a double bunk box. So basically they got 200 cells with double bunk inmates. And I went there for, it was only supposed to be like 90 days, but I ended up doing longer than that. Because you caught another charge in there? Yeah, I feel like they set me up because of the so on staff. The first first thing, they they supposed to match you up evenly with like somebody probably you could get compatible with. And the first dude they put me in was some big black dude. Yeah, I think they wanted to beat me up, but he ended up being cool because when I came in the cell and I was talking to him, I was a little, you know, on point. But then when I found out he was blood, I felt a little at ease because, you know, blood in New York State is ruthless. 
they'll cut you, stab you, but at least you know they ain't gonna try to rape you or nothing like that. So I was like, all right, I could, I could deal with this. And we ended up being cool. So I think they was mad because he was known. He was telling me he was beating up his monkeys. So he, he ain't tried with me though. He's cool. So how old was he compared to you? He was a grown man. So they put a 16-year-old in the cell with a... Yeah, grown man. Once you go upstate and you get that DIN number, you with the adults. The first day I went to was kind of adolescent. It was Washington. It was mixed with grown men, but after that, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So they moved, once you got sentenced, they moved you from Rikers to that jail. You were, what was No, that? I went to reception jail first, downstate. Okay. And then I went to what they consider adolescent jail, which was Washington. And then you got kicked out of there. Yeah, for the salt on staff. And now you're with the big boys. Yeah, well, the Washington had adults in there too, but you know, the adults don't want to go to the adolescent jail. They don't want to go to Green Washington. They rather just go. What we used to call them the coffee drinkers. <laughs> you know? Why the coffee drinkers? Oh, that's what we used to call them. OT. We used to call them that too. Old timers. Yeah. So, did you get respect by the other inmates because you allegedly beat up, you know, the guards? It did kind of work in my favor. There, I was seeing people like coming through the cages. Yo, why you did that? I was just like. It did help in a way, yeah. How did, the, you know, having those uh, accusations against you affect you throughout the rest of your sentence with other guards? Yeah, that's why when I went to the S block, they I tell you, they put me with that guy, hoping I'd get beat up, and I didn't. So I think they were mad. One day I got a piece of mail. It was pictures from a friend, but he was throwing up gang signs in the picture. So as soon as I got the letter, they searched my cell and found the picture and charged me with gang-related material. And I tried to explain to them, you just gave me the piece of mail. So I felt set up, yeah. Holy cow. So yeah. did they continuously like read Yeah, I got yourself? more box time for that. And then I got another more box time again because I got into one of my bunkies. So when when you're in the box in these as New York State prisons as a teenager, do they let you out for more time or are you treated equally Every, as an adult? Everything is in your cell. The bathroom, your shower, and you go in a little cage in your back door, which they call the rec pen. And how often do you get to use that? The rec pen, I think you go every day like an hour or something like that. The shower, I think, is like three times a week. And how are you doing, like, mentally at that age? What were, like, the mental effects of that? Uh, it was still new to me, so I was just taking it day by day. I didn't really think too far into it. I was thinking about what jail I'm going to next. Were you feeling, like, tougher? Like, uh, you know, like, y y y this is what you wanted? Like, you were gaining street cred at all? No, nah, I felt like I knew how to bid at that point because I already knew, like, I already knew how to make a razor. So everywhere I went, that's the first thing I'd do. I'd make a razor till I could get an actual, like, shank. But I used to pop the shaving razors, and I'll cut out a potato chip bag, the shiny part on the inside, and I'll put that where the razor was. So it looks like the razor's still in there, and I'll put, like, hair and stuff mm -hmm. on it and give it back to the officer. So I knew everywhere I go, I, the first thing I'm going to do is get a razor. So I was not too worried. And and why did you need a razor? Because I was, I was not sure. Like I said, Rikers was wild. Upstate didn't feel as wild as Rikers was, to be honest. So I was just, just in case. So where do you go to next after that? After that, they sent me to Eastern Correctional Facility, which is like a, it's a max B, but it's like an honor jail. But I only got to stay there for a couple of weeks. I was hoping to stay there. Because it was laid back. Why did they move you to that one? Because the only reason they put me there, because there was a riot in the jail, and they had to make space for other people to take up the box space. And I was about to get out the box. Okay. Yeah, so they didn't, they wasn't going to keep me there anyway. They sent me to this in the parody jail. And what was this new facility like for you? Easton? Easton was laid back. Like I said, I didn't stay long. They ended up sending me to Clinton. And Clinton has a terrible rep. Yeah, Clinton is a bad jail. And how old are you now when you go into Clinton? 17 yet? Or? I was probably, yeah, I think I was like 17. I was close to the end of my, I went there with only a couple months left. Wow. So that's the when I took it serious. I was a little scared. I was like, damn, I'm going to Max. I'm about to go home. And how do the inmates there treat you? And are you mixed in with the adults there too? Yeah, I was like one of the youngest kids in the jail. That's crazy that they put a 17-year-old in there. Yeah. Holy cow. I was there. And who approaches you first when you get there? What was like the interactions with your cellmate? Well, the first bunkie I had was some old school Puerto Rican dude. And people kept telling me, watch your bunkie. I'm like, watch my bunkie. So then I asked somebody I was cool with, like, yo, why people keep saying watch my bunkie? And they were like, yo, he like boys. So I was like, what? So I was like, they were like, don't worry about it, though. When we seen you in the cell and we already spoke to him, he's not going to try nothing. So what's that? They they say he likes boys. So you go in there. What happens? Well, I was the thing that messed my head up was at, at one point he was sharpening the sink, and I was watching out for the guards for him. And I was thinking in my head, like, damn, he could have tried to use that shit on me if I wasn't on point. 
Yeah, how because do you, he was a cool dude. I ain't think none of it. How do you even sleep peacefully when you see a you know an inmate that's your bunkmate with a shank yeah. and and with a reputation like yeah, that? Yeah, I asked him about it eventually though. I told him like it was something. He was like, "Nah, I wasn't trying no shit like that with you. They hate us or whatever." He said, "But at that point, I already knew I was chill. like the older dudes used to try to school me, yo, youngin, you shouldn't be chilling with this and that, but." I used to be like, I chill with the young wild dudes. At least I ain't got to worry about these dudes with 20 years in on some gay stuff, you know? Were guys trying to jam you up because you were on short time? Nah, I wasn't telling people unless they was my friend. Mm. And plus, I already lost my good time at that point. So I was like, if anything go down, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just go to the box or whatever. Oh, yeah, guys couldn't really jam you up to take away more time from yeah, you. Yeah, so I was like, fuck it, if it go down, we do whatever. I'm going to the box, fuck it. What would you do for money because you didn't have outside support? Draw. I would draw, like, people's envelopes and stuff. Ah, and you would sell that? Yeah. Oh, so you were you had an artistic uh, sense to you. Yeah, you know, we grew up doing graffiti, stuff like that, so we knew how to draw a little bit. I wasn't no Picasso or nothing, but, yeah. So that kind of carried over into the jewelry business you would later start? Yeah, I guess you could say that. I never thought of it like that, yeah. Interesting. And did you maintain any contact with your brother during this prison sentence? Well, he was in the army, so we we speak occasionally through letters and stuff, or people would let us know. But yeah, at, at some point, I spoke to him on the phone. Like one time, I had an incident where it was about to go down, and I called him. I really didn't want to like go out, but I told him the situation, and he was like, "Fuck that, you guys." So he kind of hyped me up in that one. <laughs> and, and what? And he gave you advice to handle it. Yeah, he said, "You gotta do what you gotta do." So I just I just thought about him when I did it. I said, "Fuck it." <laughs> Do you think he missed street life at all when he nah. was talking to you? He was glad he was out of that? I don't think we were ever bad kids. I think we just dealt. I would say I, we weren't bad kids. We were just really good at adapting. So if you put us in a messed up environment, we're going to adapt to it eventually. What would you say is the number one thing you wish you could change about your childhood? Mm, I don't know because I don't think I, everything happens for a reason. None of that was our fault, except obviously the committing crimes and stuff was our fault, but the circumstance wasn't our fault, but we probably wouldn't be entrepreneurs right now if it wasn't for that struggle. Yeah. So you get out at 17 now? No, I got out at 19. At 19 years old? Yeah. Oh, so you went in at 16 and then it carried all the way to 19. Yeah. So now you're 19, you get out of that last prison, what happens? What do you do? Well, when I came out... Um, I started staying with my brother, but I still had thinking, thinking. So I was looking for a job, but you know, the typical victim mindset where it's like, I can't get a job because my record, you start believing it. I started selling drugs because I couldn't get a job. And then I eventually got a job, but at that point I was already making money selling drugs. So I was just doing both. What, why did he let you stay with him and knowing um, that you were into still criminal activity? Because uh, like, we didn't think of it like that. That was just regular for us. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't. He was still. He was young in the military. I don't know to be honest. You have to ask him. <laughs> Did you know um, that you would get into potentially more trouble now that you were a felon and selling drugs, or you didn't care? I didn't even think about. It. I didn't care. I just wanted money. That's all I thought about money. And did you start making some good money now selling drugs? Well, by my standard now, I wouldn't say good money, but back then, yeah, I felt like I was doing something. What were you selling, and how much do you think you were making? I was selling. I started with weed. Because I felt like it wasn't that bad of a charge, but then escalated to crack. I was selling mostly crack. And was it easy to obtain crack at that age? Yeah. We was obtaining it since 14. Mm. Yeah, so it was easy. And it was a quick flip. You get it, you can move a minimum, at least an eight ball a day. I would try to usually make like a thousand for the day. A thousand bucks for yourself? Yeah, not all profit, but that was my quota pretty much to myself. And you were just doing it on your own? Yeah, well, eventually I got workers later on and stuff, yeah. Okay. And do you ever think now, like if you, you have an entrepreneurial sense, um, if you applied that to something, you know, when you were younger, some type of entrepreneurial legal business, you would have been better off? Well, we tried because when we were younger, like I said, we used to pack bags in the supermarket, sell with snow. And at one point we even started a little vending machine route. Mm -hmm. So we always had the entrepreneurial spirit. It's just, I was just looking at whatever's lucrative and easily accessible. Yeah. You wanted kind of like the easy way out. Yeah. Because I figured if I would make good money with that, I would invest in something legal anyway. When you got out and you were 19, were you had any relationship with your mom again, or were you just kind of doing your own thing? Just doing my own thing. Yeah. Do you wish you had a relationship with her when you got out? Well, we actually take care of her right now. Okay. Yeah, because you know she's elderly and stuff like that. 
Yeah. yeah. I was mad at her. I felt like she didn't love us when we were younger, but as I, I got older and I realized she, she wasn't fit to, you know, pretty much take care of herself, how would we expect her to take care of us? It was not her fault. So now you're 19 and you're selling drugs. How long does that go on for before you get busted again? I was probably home only nine months, if that. And that's it? You didn't have much of a run? No, I got called Mark Money. Yeah, with what? Mark Money. What does that mean? Basically, somebody buys drugs from you and they got a picture of the serial number. And if they catch you with that money with the serial number, you get charged for the sale. So how long after you did that transaction did they get you? Like an hour later. I, I made the sale. I went upstairs. I came back out, and next thing you know, some some big dude. I noticed something was funny because when he turned the corner, he looked big, and he was looking at me. So I'm thinking in my head, like, what, are you trying to take my jewelry or something? Like, and then he turned and picked up the pay phone. Nobody was using pay phones. So I went to walk past him. He just turned around and, and grabbed me, but I thought like he was trying to rob me, so I went to swing at him. And it was like a bunch of cars, and they swarmed me. And next thing you know, I'm in the handcuffs again. And they haul you to the prince precinct? Or? Yeah, I went to jail. I had a parole hold. So I had to stay and deal with that case. Oh, because you were on parole. Yeah, so I ended up getting a year for that. And then I would have had to do another year for parole violation, but they gave me an alternative, which was like a boot camp, 97 days. So I did the boot camp. A lot of people was turning it down. They didn't want to do it because they was already institutionalized. So they was like, I'd rather go to jail. I'm not letting nobody scream at me. But my brother was in the military. I'm like, oh, if he could do it, I'll do this shit. So you had to do a year at, at Rikers. Okay. And then I had to go off state again and do the boot camp. Wow, so you're back at Rikers then at, at 20 years old now? Yeah. W was that experience different than when you were there younger? Yeah, it felt easy compared to the first one. I was already, like I said, I was already, I knew how to jail at that point, so I was chilling. It wasn't like heavy extortion. When you're in the adolescent, as soon as you walk in the house, immediately they on you. They trying to extort you. You don't have no time. The adults, they're not going to really extort you unless you're like super weak. It's just mainly fights over the phone. Are guys respecting you more now that, uh, at that time, now that you're there on a second bid? Yeah, because, yeah. Like I said, they, they go by how you move, so they could they could tell who's who and what's what. You know, so if I come in the house, usually I'll just put my stuff down and come right out the cell. It's kind of like you sub, you subliminally showing them, like, I'm ready to go. I ain't getting comfortable. Yeah. So if we could, let's get it out the way now. Was your mindset different that last year at Rikers? Nah, it was terrible still. Yeah, I was still stinking thinking back then. Why do you think that was? Because I didn't, that's all I knew. Yeah. Did you have dreams or aspirations of what you were going to do after that year? Were you making a plan? Were you getting back on the streets? Or yeah, did you want something better? I, I hear people like Jim Carrey and Manifestation, and I notice now that I'm older, like I always manifested stuff. Like, cause you know, you daydream in jail, you, you aspire to do stuff, so... I think that I always had aspirations. I just never had opportunity. What would you say is like your biggest aspiration at that time while you were sitting in the jail cell, like thinking about life and, and, and whatnot? I used to think when I got tired of selling drugs, I used to think like, you know, I, even when I was selling drugs, I used to think if I had the right opportunity, I wouldn't be doing this. I never felt like I wanted to do that. I just never wanted to, to have, I never had the opportunity. I never felt like a regular person. I always felt like I was meant for more. So I didn't want to settle for just a nine to five situation, even though I did at plenty of points in my life. But I always looked at it as a stepping stone. Were you getting into more uh, altercations at Rikers that last year? Nah, it was every. I think every jail and I've been to every house I, I get into at least one altercation, but it wasn't overbearing. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been. I had quite a few incidents. Yeah, but what was like the the craziest one you've been involved in? The crazy, I haven't been in, like, no knife fights or nothing like these dudes, but I have plenty of fights. Uh, I broke my hand one time on, on a guy, and then he tried to get me back while I had the broken hand. <laughs> you hit him that hard that you broke your hand? Yeah. And what happens when you get, like, a broken hand in prison? Do they put a cast on it? Yeah. Well, I, you can't really say that you got into a fight. I had to act like I had a slip and fall. Yeah, because I... The guy was trying me, and then he said, you know, he's the older dude. You'll go in the corner, I'm going to beat you up or something like that. When he turned like this and turned back, I just hit him. And then he went down. I didn't even expect it. I was like, oh, shit. And then the CO came out. I was like, yo, I think he's seen it. He was like, yo, everything good? I'm like, yo, we good? And I just, <laughs> I went to the visit with my brother. My hand was broke. And he was like, yeah. So when I went back to the house, I faked the floor. I went and got a cast. And I seen him like a week later. 
And he was trying to move on me in the hallway while I had the cast, but I had a friend with me that didn't let it go down like that. Why would he even try you to begin with? What, did you do something or were you moving? I was young, way? man. I was young. I'm with the adults now. And, you know, he was mad because it was always something stupid. I was working the mess hall. I wasn't showing up to work. I was getting paid to be there, but I'll come there. And, and he was like, you never here. And you think you're going to come here and do what you want? And I told him, bro, you just a CEO or something? Like, what? And he was like, who you think you're talking to, you know? And he's like, I'm going to beat you up, whatever he said. And I wasn't, I'm not going in the corner. Was, you know, I'm not, I hit him by surprise. Honestly, it was a sucker punch, but he knew it was coming. He just thought we was going to like do like a boxing match in the corner or something. So you get out and then you go to boot camp. Do they transport you to boot camp or do you have to self-surrender after that year? Nah, right from right because they, they ship you on the bus, the same process, go to intake and then you got to wait to get shipped there. And are you handcuffed and all that during? Yeah, the thing? same process. The only difference is the jail you go to is boot camp. Shave your head, sir, yes, sir, run two miles a day, all that. And are there gangs there or is it, what is that yeah, like? Yeah, there's gangs everywhere. But that pro, see, they got two two boot camp programs. One is for uh, first time offenders, pretty much, nonviolent, and they're six months. The one I went to is more for pro violators. So it's more career criminals than the one I was in, but a shorter time. And what was a typical day like? You wake up in five in the morning screaming, ah, sir, yes, sir. And, and then you run two miles, you work out, you eat chow. It's, it's definitely tough. Were there a lot of guys that couldn't handle that and had to drop out? Yeah, dudes in the first week was like, "I'm send me to jail. I ain't doing this shit. And then they would get more time by going to jail? Yeah. So it was less time if you went to boot yeah, camp. it was 97 days boot camp or a year. Mm. So I said, I'm taking that 97 and coming home. What was the sleeping arrangements like at boot camp? Bunk beds. Okay. And when the thing, the revelies, I think they call it, goes off in the morning like the horn, you got to jump out of your bed screaming, oh. Yeah. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah, it's definitely funny. There's a lot of funny stuff was going on in there. So uh, was there any issues that you had at boot camp or did you complete it sex successfully and make it through? I completed successfully. See, the key with boot camp is you try to blend in. If you try to stand out, you're going to make yourself a target and you're going to have a rough but, you know, it's set up. You're going to go through stuff. It's stupid stuff. But. Do you think boot camp helped change your, you know, your vision and aspect about life and thoughts about life? Or did you still have that same kind of negative mentality? Yeah, it didn't really help much. I was just proud that cause I, while I was there, I was thinking about what my brother went through. So I'm like, All right, this is what he was doing in the military. So it kind of had me a little more respect for what he went through. Can you get visits while at boot camp? Yeah, but you really don't want to. Because you got to sit at, like, modified parade rest. Your head is bald. Yeah, your uniform is creased. <laughs> so it was extremely strict and structured. Yeah. Were guys uh, getting drugs in or, or doing anything nah. with contraband? It's, no. Uh, it's airtight. Yeah. It, it was like a pee to pay for Paul situation. So if you do something wrong, we all got to deal with it. Was there women there or just men? There was women, but you can't get caught looking at them. And they were in, like, separate dorm areas? No, nah, they'd be on the blacktop with us. And they even, when they sing Cadence, they'll say, uh, eyeballs will get your program took in. So basically, if you look at us, you out of here. Oh, so they, they had the women actually living there, too, with yeah, you guys? Yeah, Were they in separate dorms, or? Yeah, separate dorms, yeah. It but was, you guys had access to it? We just walked past them, but you're not allowed to look at them. Wow. Yeah. How many guys are getting jammed up for looking at the woman? Well, you're going to get jammed up every day. If you don't make your bed right, you're in trouble. <laughs> like, for example, if you don't eat your food, you got 10 minutes to eat your food. If you don't finish it, you're probably going to have to wear it or something like that. Like, put the mashed potatoes in your pocket or something all day. Like, they do stuff like that, yeah. Did you have more freedom at the boot camp rather than in jail? No. You felt it was stricter? Definitely stricter. You can't sit on your bed throughout the day, nothing. What kind of charges uh, were individuals that were at the boot camp facing or was, had? That one was all parole violators. Yeah. That's interesting. That It's an interesting concept that if you violate parole, you can choose to go to boot camp. Yeah. It was definitely an experience. What about guys that were, like, out of shape or anything like that? How did they survive going <laughs> They try to be slick and go to medical dorm, but it didn't work out sometimes. Sometimes if it's due, like, the running was hard for a lot of people, so... Sometimes they'll be throwing up and stuff, and they'll make them hug a tree in the freezing weather until we finish type stuff. <laughs> yeah, seriously, hug a tree, like, and we run past them, and they, they probably wish they was running with us because at least they'll be warm. 
And they're uh, like clothesless or? No, nah, you got uniforms and stuff. And yeah. they're just forced to hug a tree in the winter. Yeah. How long would they be out on the tree for? Two hours, three hours, as long as, however long the drill sergeant wanted to. And if they remove themselves from the tree, what happens? We all probably get in trouble for him. Wow. So it's extremely strict. Yeah. So basically they know if he, if we get in trouble for him, somebody might try to deal with him later. So. So what was your mindset leaving boot camp? And what was your plan after boot camp? I was just excited to get out. And I was trying to get, I, at that point, I was trying to get my life together. I started college and stuff like that. Oh, you did start college? Yeah, but I was still selling drugs. Why did you uh, s decide to start college? What was that, uh, the, the ultimate reason behind that? Well, I went for business, so I was I wanted to open a business. And did you have a business in mind at the time? No. You just knew you want to get into business? Yeah. And you, but you're yet you're back to drugs. Yeah, cause I was gonna sell drugs to save money to start a business. <laughs> so yeah. why, despite you know all the trouble you got in before, you went back to drugs? Because I felt like I didn't. I didn't. Feel, I felt like I could be slick, slicker with it, and smarter. I didn't. Think, I thought I could still get over it, get away with it. But, but it didn't work out. Nope. I called more cases. Couldn't even finish college. I oh, went you, back to jail again. You got busted again for again. the drugs. Yeah. And how much time do you get this time for that? That time I finished my parole, like, I had to finish up the parole like seven months, and then I was able to bail out. And then I ended up being one case, and I got a program for the other one. And at that point, that's when I really changed my life. Do you feel like the system wasn't strict enough on you, that, you know, the first couple times that you kept getting back into it? Like, the like if, imagine that first case you got like five years. Do you think it would have been different for you? No. I think I was just hard-headed. I don't think it would have changed nothing, to be honest. I think jail makes people worse sometimes. So why was it that last time that made you change your mindset and, and go in a different direction? Because I had aspirations to be more. I knew I was better than that. I knew, like, something got to give, man. I got. I wanted to make money. I knew I was, I was reading more books as far as financial literacy and things like that. I was trying to crack the code at that point. Was your brother trying to help you at all, kind of put you on the right path? Yeah, he'll try to help me. He'd be at boot camp sending me money, and I'd just be buying drugs with it. At boot camp? Yeah, like not boot camp. At that point, he was actually in the military working. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, he, you mean he was in the military sending you money Yeah, like if I get out of jail, he'll okay. send me some bread, make sure I'm all right. And you were just buying more drugs. Yeah, because you, know, you don't want to take nothing from the way. You want to make your own money. W where were you living at that time? The second time I went to jail, I was living in Harlem. Yeah, but... And you were able to afford your own place and everything like no, that? No, my brother helped me at first, yeah. Oh, so he was super supportive throughout everything. Yeah, we twins. If I got a 1000 and he got a dollar, we both got $500. Do you believe in, like, that twin uh, telepathy or, or anything like that, that you guys can kind of read each other's minds? Not read each other's minds, but if, if he give me a certain look, I know what he's thinking in certain situations, yeah. Do you guys, like, uh, have a sense of feeling? Like, say he was all the way wherever for um, training and in the military. Do you feel like he's with you? No, but I am grateful that we both didn't stay in jail together because I feel like if I get jumped, I could take an L, but if he would have got jumped, I probably would have caught a new charge. So I think it was meant for us not to be there at the same time. Do you feel like you're the protector out of the two of you? No, nah, I think it's equal. I think we just help, hold each other down. Okay. So that last time you get out of jail and tell us about that transformation, you know, and why your mindset changed and what you started to get into that made it different. Well, I think the the craziest thing I've I seen this guy about to get out of jail after like 14 years and he tried to commit suicide. So and when they brought him back to the house, I'm like, yo, why would you do that? You about to go home. And he said some dumb stuff like, oh. I'm trying to get SSI. I don't got no family. So I was like, yeah, I'm not trying to have my... That was like my mind. Like, yeah, I can't be like that. That's crazy. You was making all this money in the street. Now you want SSI. <laughs> so that. So when I came home, um, my brother helped me out get a job with a moving company. And the guys that were running the moving company make a lot of money. So I was thinking like, I thought they were lying because they were cool. They were nice cars. I was like, nah, they got to be doing something on the side. And then my first day working, my legs were tired. I was like, yeah, I can't do this shit. But then when I made like 500 for the day, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to definitely come back tomorrow. And then eventually um, we worked our way up and we started our own moving company. You and your brother? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, did the moving company um, care about your record at all? Nah, they just want you to work hard. 
do you find that most jobs in New York um, don't necessarily care about the record and more or less just want you to work hard? They're looking for hardworking people. Well, I can't really speak on that because I haven't had too much like corporate jobs or anything like that. So after the moving company, we did it for a few years. We made some good money, but we ended up shutting down and buying some property. But uh, I already had a CDL. So uh, truck driving, I think, is a great career path for any any felon because, you know, you work on your own. You already have a boss breathing down your neck and you're going to make good money. So I guess I'll reframe it as like there's there's ways if you're a hard worker to find work. Like you, there's there's ways to not just be you know like broke on, on your on your butt. I think as a felon, you should figure out how you could become valuable, and if you have a skill of trade, you offer value to an employer, and you can negotiate a better wage or more fair treatment. Obviously, if you don't have skills, you're gonna get the bottom of the barrel jobs. Did you see a lot of guys that you were in prison with or knew growing up struggle with you even after you kind of found your own footings and why? Uh, well, I see people I grew up with still doing the wrong things and they they making money so it'd be tempting to but i always remind myself no nah, don't do that because you know the end result of that yeah but I, when i first got a job believe it or not i was a little embarrassed i felt like people thought like oh look he's going broke he got to get a job now that's how i felt so now that i'm older i try to take pride in working hard and let people know that it's cool it's cool to work hard yeah why do you think that that where do you think that mentality comes from being around lazy people that want the easy way out, you know, they feel like, oh, I ain't doing that. I'm going to get money. You know, that's where I think it came from. Do you still associate with people that were a part of the street life? or do you? I mean, I'm a jeweler, you know. We <laughs> have a lot of shady customers here and there, you know. Well, aside from customers, I mean, like, do you keep people around you in your circle or do you yeah. avoid that? Well, that's part of the reason. When we had the moving company, we were hiring the whole neighborhood. Anybody that want to work, so... And definitely now with this business venture, I'm a little more reserved and selective with who I let in to that extent. Did you run into uh, any issues in New York trying to build a company as a felon? Uh, no, nah, not really. And even like opening the jewelry business? No, the jewelry business is tough because most jewelers are second generation or they come from money and we didn't start with money or any connections. So it was a little tough just to make connections and get fair prices. Yeah, so how do you even get into that? How do you move from moving to jewelry? Well, it was really my brother's idea, and I was just trying to figure out how I could add value to it. He was taking a bunch of jewelry classes, and, and it started as a hobby during COVID, and then it ended up turning to business. And how did you, where do you even go to start the jewelry business? How do you, like, uh, you know, build the inventory? How do you get the idea for it, get the location, everything like that? Yeah, well, most jewelers in the industry are like glorified middlemen. Most jewelers can't even make a piece of jewelry. So my brother was taking all the classes to actually learn, but it's really hard to find good classes and really expensive. So maybe one day we aspire to make an affordable, more option for people to learn how to get into the industry. Because it's like, I'm sure you know, nobody tells you no secrets about the industry. They, they If they tell you the secrets, they feel threatened by you. Because it's all finesse. It's a, it's a game where, you know, like I said, a lot of them are middlemen. A lot of them can't make a piece. We never expected to have a storefront or anything like that. We was just going to do only custom from the home office. And then it just ended up being too much meeting people on the street with three or four chains so they could pick one. So we figured it's probably in our best interest to get an actual location where people could come in. How do you guys stay grounded, uh, or specifically you, how do you stay grounded throughout, like there could be challenging days, you know, the economy, everything like that. Does it ever, you know, make you want to get back into the drug game? And if not, how do you, I mean, and if so, how do you avoid getting into that? Well, it's definitely tempting sometimes, but being that we had the moving company and we got rid of it, I always tell myself if I would have kept that, I probably would have achieved my goals by now. But because I couldn't take the heat at the time, I just let it go. And I, I, I don't want to make that same mistake twice. So I pushed through the tough days. What advice would you give to, you know, teenagers growing up in neighborhoods that are, you know, there's a lot of crime, there's a lot of drugs, and they're kind of exposed to that street life, what advice would you give to those younger people? Uh, just believe, don't believe everything you see, especially now with the social media, everything is smoke and mirrors. So, you know, everybody always, you only see the overnight success, you don't see what people went through to get there, and you just don't look for the quick way. What comes quick leaves quick. Do you think social media condones and, and kind of like influences people to sell drugs and, and get involved in that lifestyle? No, I think I think social media is made to, to help you consume whatever you're interested in. So whatever you look for, they're going to show you more of that. So I said, if you believe 
If you look at the negative stuff, that's what you're gonna find. Cause I use social media now in a positive way. I try to watch enlightening videos and things like that about finance, real estate. So it's what you look for. They're gonna show you more of. So if you're interested in rapping and and stuff like that, they're gonna show you more of that. So out of all the time you spent in prison, how much time do you actually think you did altogether? And do you ever reflect back on like you, you missed some like kind of prime younger years of your life? Like you didn't get the high school experience, you didn't get the college experience. Yeah, I, I think I probably did for maybe, I don't know, seven years or something around there. And I, it was in my late teens, early 20s. So I definitely missed out on some important years. And I just try to live like through my nephew and my kids and try to show them like that's what you should be doing. Because if I would have had a role model that helped me stay positive, I would have did a lot better in life. But I didn't have nobody. I had to learn everything on my own. So you have kids now? Yeah, I got two. How do you make sure that they don't follow the same path you did? Well, I feel like in the... And most lower income households, they try to push you out the door to get a job quick and help pay bills. And I feel like if you want to go to school, if it takes you longer to figure out something in life, I'm not going to kick you out till you're in your 30s, you know. If you need me to support you while you go through college financially, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to try to advise you with what I know. And hopefully everything my brother and I is building right now, they could take to the next level in the next generation. Do you talk to your kids about your past and, you know, talking about prison openly? Or are you kind of embarrassed by that? How do you have those conversations? I, my kids are young, so I really haven't had that conversation with them. My nephew knows. He's a teenager, so he knows more. I try to tell him, you know, don't don't be a follower, be a leader. Will you have that conversation with your kids? If I have to address it, yeah, I'll address it with them. I'll tell them, you know, I can't change what happened. Uh, it made me a better person as I learned in life. But they don't have no reason to even do that type of stuff I did, other than acceptance, which I hope they wouldn't have to seek. Now, what do you think the next, you know, what five years looks like? Do you have goals? Do you have dreams? What, where do you want to go to from here? Well, right now, we we, we call it, our slogan is Blonde's Golden Diamonds, Brooklyn's Best Jewelers. So after we, we officially the, considered by many Brooklyn's best, we're trying to be New York's best and then grow from there. So we, And like I said, we want to offer, we're going to do a podcast based on, um, we're going to highlight the, the jewelry people wear, what it means to them, and and mainly the how they're able to afford something like that, any advice they could give to people in that industry and things like that. So we're going to do the podcast we got our jewelry store, and eventually we want to open a training program to help others get in the industry. And the ultimate goal is always real estate, so just keep buying property. Awesome. Well, Nick, thank you for uh, coming out here today and uh, sharing your story with us. Um, and, you know, I wish you the best with, with the business and everything you do in the future. Appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me.